Imagine being able to effortlessly organize the thoughts in your mind using a mind map and then making a memory palace from the mind map and generally experiencing the power of both mind mapping and the memory palace technique combined. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. Hit that thumbs up for the love of memory and to help the robots remember that we humans still care about our minds and get subscribed if you're new here because we are going deep into everything about better living through better memory. Now let's quickly review what a memory palace is, what a mind map is. And mind mapping has different definitions throughout time and there's magnetic mind mapping. So the basic concept as I remember it from Tony Buzan who actually was a mentor of mine is that you want to essentially reproduce on paper or on the screen a brain cell. And there's an idea there that by organizing information in a way that represents how the brain looks deep inside, you're going to get more organization, more creativity, more visual thinking, or what Buzan called radiant thinking. And I absolutely love that, and he has rules and principles that I've shared on this channel before. But that's the broad overview. Now, I personally think about it a little bit differently, and I practice it a little bit differently, but I use his rules overall, and they are powerful. Now, the memory palace technique, of course, is well known, but for those of you who may be new to it, first of all, the benefits, enhanced recall, the ability to experience a completely different level of visualization. In fact, at least eight levels of visualization or 28 if you really want to go hook, line and sinker with the magnetic memory method. And I sure hope you do. Now, the memory palace is a way that you use familiar locations and you construct a journey in your mind and then you place associations and you elaborate those associations and then when you revisit the associations, you recall target information. So just a very simple example, if you wanted to remember my last name, Metivier, you could place in a living room or a bedroom an image of the Mets playing and Liv Tyler is in the stadiums and she says yay when they get a home run. Met Tivier, right? Now, sometimes you might be thinking, oh my goodness, what, uh, what if I say Met Livier because of Liv Tyler being in there? And, you know, that can happen. It happens to me sometimes. But we're doing better memory and we can correct all of those mistakes. But how can we correct mistakes? from the foundation of having started to layer in the memory in the first place. So you can't really correct a thing that you don't remember. And that's the principle here. And the mistakes are fine. The mistakes will teach you a lot of things. And chances are you won't make that mistake anyway. But sometimes it happens, especially when it's learning new words that are unfamiliar sounding or not that common. But it's still a path to correcting things. So there's a synergy between combining mind maps and memory palaces and one can enhance the other. And it's really, really powerful to bring them together. Now, the benefits may be organization, improved recall, deeper comprehension, and an, a, a better ability to just think back to things and then riff on it, describe things spontaneously because you've absorbed things so much more deeply. So I think one of the key benefits here is not only being able to remember better, but to be able to express things on the fly in a more innovative manner. And I think that has a lot to do with some of Tony Bizan's rules, because you're using a central image in his conception on the mind map. And that centrality gives your mind a reference point to think back to. So if you had, let's say, the Mets in a memory palace, like right here, and you thought of Liv Tyler being in there going, yay, for Metivier, well, you're giving yourself a central image. But instead of it being in a memory palace, it's right there in the center of the mind map. And the way the mind map works is that you have these tributaries that go around in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. And that is essentially very much like a memory palace. You're going from station to station and each little place is going to have its own place. That's, that's the whole point, right? But I don't think a lot of people think of mind mapping that way. So what I did is I thought of what Buzan was saying, and I just thought, what if I set a rule? And on most mind maps, I just have a limited set of places, and I don't make as many tributaries and different 
points always going out in this kind of synaptic manner through tributaries and whatnot that he talked about. And I just kind of cap it in a certain place. And that capping limits less is more has helped me in so many ways. And one example is when I passed level three in Mandarin, because Mandarin is, you know, you've got characters, you've got tones, you have the meaning of the character, and you have uh, many, many different things that you have to think about in terms of figuring out what these characters mean. So I made mind maps, and I was able really quickly to memorize these characters for level three, which is approximately 300 words. So whether you do it for language learning or anything else, here's your first step. Choose your topic or the information that you want to memorize. Then get a big piece of paper, as big as you can get, I would recommend. Now, some people are going to want to do this digitally, and that's cool if that's what you want to do. I don't do digital mind maps, so I'm not going to speak to it, but if that's your, your jam, that's fine. The only thing I think is that you have the risk of not necessarily getting all the same benefits because screens, where, where, where is the 45th image in your screen compared to where is the 15th mind map in a mind map journal, for example, right? Now, I don't want to go on a long talk about spatial memory and how all that works, but there is research on it that you can look into for yourself and you may not have problems with digital. I do, and it may have to do with my age, how little time that I've spent with organizing digital information compared to analog information in physical books and so forth. So I don't, I don't want to be dogmatic about it, but if you find that you struggle to remember in the ways that you can with mind maps, just consider doing it on paper in notebooks. And it doesn't have to be big pieces of paper. I've done mind maps on index cards this small. I don't find it works as well, but you can do it. At the end of the day, the key thing is to start with the main topic in the center. And you can do that either with a keyword or you can do it with an image that represents the keyword. There's going to be pros and cons either way, but it's mostly pros. If you have an image, when you look at that image, you need to translate that image in your mind. What was that image all about? What did I want to remember here? So in some of my mind maps, there's an image maybe of a brain. And then I look at it and I go, okay, so what was it that I wanted to uh, be studying or thinking about or organizing my thoughts around? And then I'll go, oh, yes. And sometimes the individual images that surround the central image will help trigger that memory. This is memory exercise. It is called active recall. You're challenging yourself to go, what was that? And then you solve the puzzle. The solving of the puzzle itself, the challenge of doing so helps form memories. And that will be the same when you branch out from that central image and you place all the subtopics around the central image. And I recommend that you go deliberately clockwise or counterclockwise. I personally go clockwise all the time. And then just think, what is going to be my location strategy? And sometimes I'm really tight about it. And 12 o'clock is 12 o'clock. One o'clock is one o'clock. And I try to reproduce a clock and have 12 stations based on the clock. Other times I'm a little bit fast and loose and sloppy. It depends what I'm using the mind map for. The whole point is, is that explore, experiment. It's not like there's going to be some this is the way to mind map, the laws. Tony Buzan had his laws. And that's cool. And you may find them very, very valuable. I myself, I'm a little bit of a contrarian and I prefer experimentation. And I prefer to use laws of other people as a leaping board to, you know, have a, a whole new adventure. So I did follow his laws for a certain period of time, 90 days actually, if you know Metivier's razor. And then I thought, I'm going to try my own experiments. And I came up with my own mind mapping memory palace style. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Buzan talks about in Mind Map Mastery how he abandoned mind maps for memory uses anyway back in the 80s. I think that was premature. And I've picked it up and, and I'm sharing with you these ideas today. So thumbs up for that if you enjoy. Now, before we get into talking about each branch and referring more strategically to these branches or tributaries from the central image in your mind, I am reviving, revising, making better, something I've done for a long time. It used to be called the Magnetic Memory Method Mastermind, but I changed that to the Magnetic Memory Method Inner Circle. And really the reason why I changed the name is because some people 
and it's my bad, they were getting the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass confused with the Mastermind, and they are two different things. What it is, the inner circle, is monthly workshops, meetings, where the most serious nemesis get together, and we go through a presentation, and I put it together each and every month. Once a year, we usually go through the Magnetic Memory Method in full, and if you want to be invited the next time the doors open, make sure to go to magneticmerrymethod.com. Take the free course there because I want to constantly make sure that it's right for the people who love learning about memory techniques and are willing to go through the steps to learn the Magnetic Memory Method way, not because I have ego in it, but you know we need a central image. We need a focus together so that we can talk about one particular way of doing memory techniques. And I know other ways of doing memory techniques, but we want to have that shared foundation. That's what community is, right? Some sort of reference point. But I'm not dogmatic about these things. I just love memory techniques, period. But I've noticed over the years that when we have some kind of foundation to which we can refer, well, then we can mind map together and make memory palaces that make everything vivid, glorious, fulfilling. And we get rid of activity that leads to no accomplishment. It's all accomplishment all the way down. Okay, so... Some principles here are to make sure that all of these surrounding images are just as vivid and interesting to you as the central image. Now, I sometimes downplay them in the way that I write them out using keywords or secondary images, but mentally, in my mind, each part of the mind map is just as vivid as the central image. And just as in a memory palace, it's just as vivid. So if it's a word, whatever it might be, tapobahikshina papanam in Sanskrit, I'm going to use very, very vivid magnetic imagery in the memory palace, and it's the same thing on the mind map. So you want to place these images at your designated spots, and you want to think of them just as if those spots are a memory palace. And the best possible results I've gotten comes from being willing to have, one, less is more, and two, having a logical path through the mind map, just as I do in a memory palace. I'm ensuring that the path follows a structure that I don't have to memorize. It's just clockwise, always. So I don't have to think, oh, well, did I have some special path in this mind map where the third piece of information was somehow supposed to go to the fifth after that? No, 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 because that would make the review process both mentally and if I'm looking at the mind map physically, painful, annoying, not fun, and therefore less effective and definitely never efficient. So you want to be able to walk through your mind map with the same ease as you would want with a memory palace. And that's how you're going to bring the mind map and memory palace techniques together through structure, logic, limits, less is more. And that's going to allow you to refer back in your mind to where your associations were and then adjust them if you need to very, very easily because you're going to just be able to think, okay, so that was the third position, three o'clock, and then you're done. You're there. You just work on it. You elaborate it. You add the magnetic modes. There are eight main magnetic modes that I teach in the masterclass, and there are 28 in total. And you may need only three of them, but one way or the other, if you want to be able to better recall the information that you place on a mind map or in a memory palace, you're going to want to elaborate it. You're going to want to make it magnetic through the magnetic modes of elaboration. How would you like a practical demonstration or an example of how this works from someone other than me? I'm happy to show you all kinds of mind maps that I've made, but the technique in action is best interpreted individually, and that's what Kecko did. And I've always really loved what she did by mind mapping the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass itself. So what you're seeing here is that she has interpreted that circular structure into a seashell pattern. And that partly comes from how I talk about magnetic seashelling in the Masterclass. So she's literally made not just a central image, but the whole mind map is the image of magnetic seashelling. That's really, really brilliant what she did there. And then she's following a circular journey. It's not exactly clockwise the way that I would do it, but she's got a number of keywords and 
just pretty much that's the magnetic Mary method at a glance as she understood it. So it's a kind of note taking. Now I would find personally it be a little bit difficult to recall that as a mind palace or a memory palace. But let's look at another example that I used to help pick up some German vocabulary. I have here a fish as the central image. And the reason I had that at the time is because these words have to do with the kitchen and with preparing for dinner and then cleaning up after dinner. And at the 12 o'clock position, we have vorbereiten, which means to prepare. And we can go through all the different words, but at the end of the day, the point is, is that if you count them, there's 12 of them, and then I could literally just go through my mind. But what I'm thinking of when I look through those images in my mind are not the words, but the images that I placed in those specific positions, just as if the mind map was a memory palace. So for Brighton, you can remember, what was it, Happy Gilmore, that movie, and just golfing, and you know Adam Sandler, I think, was the actor. For that sort of thing, right? And Brighton for prepare, or for Brighton to prepare, he's preparing for the strike that he's going to make on the ball. I'm not a golfer, so I don't know all the terms. Uh, he's teeing up, is that right? Uh, and Brighton, so it's a very, very bright golf ball. And I think of that scenario playing out, not in a memory palace or a traditional memory palace like this space in a room, but literally on that mind map. And it's very, very beautiful. And so if it's sets in, you know, like uh, there again, you ha have a chess set and the chess set has all the players sitting in a Zen meditation. So that's an example of how it works. It's very, very simple. And you might think, well, that's not a lot of words, but it's just one mind map. And when you use the magnetic memory method principle of recall rehearsal, you can go through that mind map very, very quickly and then go on to the next and the next and the next. It is beautiful. So let's go now from theory and example to some more tips for success that I know are going to help you on this journey. So if you feel like this is new and strange territory for you, start with simple topics where each little bit of it is just a small word. Right? So I don't know what that would be for you, but in language learning, this is often very easy. If you're learning a new language, you could start with the days of the week. You could start with the colors. And yes, some languages will have grammar implications where how exactly red is said may change based on principles of gender, number, etc. Try not to overwhelm yourself with all the possible things that can go wrong. As Tony Bazan told me once, he said, always focus on what can go right. So make it simple, whatever it is, start with your central image that represents what it is that you want to remember and then all the associated parts. Lay it out in the simplest possible journey and remember that less is more because you want to be able to do recall rehearsal. Then over time, gradually increase the complexity. The other thing is, and you'll notice that I've done it in my examples, is use color in your mind maps to enhance memorability. Now, Tony Buzan says in Mind Map Mastery to have three colors, and I've generally followed that principle. But when I'm using keywords only, I tend to have more colors. And what I'm doing is literally changing colors as I go. And the reason why I do that is because it gives a little pause. It's like Mr. Miyagi and Daniel-san in The Karate Kid. You know, wax on, wax off. Well, in between waxing on and waxing off, you get a little break. And that little break helps thoughts percolate. And you have principles, really, of diffuse thinking, as they call it in memory science and learning research. And you also get a little bit of interleaving. So those are really, really powerful effects. You don't have to change colors if you don't want to. I just have found it beneficial and the research backs it up. Now, the other thing is, and I've mentioned it already, is you want to make your memory palace images on the mind map or in traditional memory palaces as vivid as possible. And you want to make them unusual. And this is kind of a topic that comes up from time to time. You know, some people say, well, I don't want weird images in my mind. I don't want my mind to be cluttered with all kinds of junk. And I would just say that's 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 interesting and it's important. And if it's important to you, then I don't know necessarily the solution. But what I would say is consider that the world often throws weird and unusual and strange images at you anyway. So wouldn't it be the higher good to be able to encounter images that you don't like and like them anyway or use them anyway without needing to like them? 
Now let's go through some potential applications. There's studying for comprehensive exams. And when I did my field exams at York University for my PhD, I had two field exams and a dissertation. And I did mind mapping a fair amount. I don't have those mind maps anymore, but they were very, very useful to spend some time mind mapping out core ideas, big ideas. I wish I could share them with you. At the end of the day, mostly what I did was just index cards and I can show you what that looked like. And that was really good as well. But in order to get the big picture of certain ideas and help see how things relate to each other, I did mind mapping. But the mind mapping I did then wasn't the mind mapping that we're talking about today anyway. But nonetheless, there's a lot of material about what I did when I got my PhD that you may find useful by going through this channel in depth. So if you aren't subscribed, make sure you do and you know n enable notifications and all that stuff so that the algos will start feeding you more and engage with it deeply and you'll get a lot out of it, I'm sure. And of course, there's always the Inner Circle invitation coming soon if you want to get hooked up over at magneticmerrymethod.com. Now, preparing for presentations or speeches is another way that I have used mind mapping. Now, in this particular case of my TEDx talk, which is probably the biggest presentation I'll ever give in my life, I can't believe that so many millions of people have watched it. Maybe I'll have a bigger one. I should, shouldn't put a limit on that. But at the end of the day, not only did I mind map that, but I mind mapped the book that that talk is drawn from. And so it was just a very, very simple process, like literally five minutes to just mind map out the core ideas that were going to be in that book. And I did it years ago. And, you know, it sat there for a while before I finally started to write the book. But then the book became the speech and on and on and on. The, bo the book actually came out after the speech, but that has to do with the lockdowns and all that sort of stuff. The point is, is that's a possible application is either book writing or speeches. Then you have project planning and management. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with memory? Well, once you've planned the project and you need to manage it, if you've made a memory palace out of the mind map, while you're in the job, you'll remember what your goals were much better, and you'll remember the granular steps that were involved in achieving the goal. It's just a wonderful thing. It's kind of like having an internal to-do list. Then there's creative writing and brainstorming. And, you know, Flyboy is this memory detective novel, a story that teaches you the art of memory, but not in a boring way. I mean, it's a legit detective novel. And this was mind mapped. And, you know, the mind map and the novel are not the same thing. In fact, there's some differences. And, of course, this novel is part one of a trilogy. But the point is, is that I got so much more depth of character, of scenario, because I mind mapped it all out. And I remembered more of what the plan was without even having to refer to the mind map. That said, here's another application. I mind map out a lot of my projects, not just novels, but courses that I make and, and some of these videos are mind mapped, etc. And when there's a topic that I need to cover or a project I need to complete where I just know that life will not be as fulfilling as it could be if I didn't get a certain topic covered and a project off my bucket list, I'll put that mind map on my desk and it will not leave that spot until that the project is done. No matter how hard it is, no matter how many moving parts there are in that project, that mind map ain't moving until it's done. And one example is when I created the Brain Exercise Bootcamp. That was a very big project. It's many, many videos and lessons and it had a lot of research that needed to be done. That mind map was on my desk for a year and a half and it did not leave until I got it done. So if you have problems with procrastination or you forget your vision, you forget what it is that you wanted to do, which may have unconscious implications, because let's face it, doing big things is hard. There's nothing worth doing that isn't going to be complicated and difficult, right? If you're struggling with that, try mind mapping it out, but go that extra step. Put the mind map in your physical space so you cannot ignore the vision, and it'll help make sure that you get it done. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a guarantee you'll get it done, but I've found it very, very useful for taking things over the finish line many, many times. So you've got better mental organization. You've got better ability to remember granular details and to remember your vision itself. I want to encourage you to try all the techniques and the variations that we talked about today. Get subscribed if you're new here. And I got a bonus tip for you in a minute, but I want to thank you for being part of this mission, especially those of you who have got my books and courses all along. And 
it's just an honor to be able to do this. And I especially thank those who are in the inner circle and remember to get involved if that sounds like something for you. Personal growth and planning is one of the best things that you can do. When I was with Tony Bazan, we mapped out the Magnetic Mary Method project, its goals, the steps that it was going to take to achieve them, and we did it in an incredibly memorable way. But right now, here's your call to adventure. Get out a big piece of paper, a little piece of paper, a digital mind mapping software, whatever is right for you, and put in the center an image that is meaningful for you when it comes to your personal vision. You could put a giant eye, like a physical eyeball for vision, or you could put the word vision, or you could put whatever that means for you, a person looking out with a telescope into the future, and then at least 12 points that relate to your vision. What are the 12 major pieces? Is it to get a business going? Is it to own your own home? Is it to read the world's great literature? Whatever they, those may be. Maybe it's just the 12 titles of the most important books that have been on your bucket list that you've never gotten around to. And maybe you need a different central image, like a clock, and you're going to work on organizing your time so you get those books read. Either way, it's a simple exercise for you to get started creating a mind map. And then the next step is to think about each of those 12 positions as a position so that your mind map becomes a memory palace. And then elaborate each position using the magnetic modes if you know them, or whatever elaboration means to you wherever you are on your journey. Lots of material about that on this channel. And you start to make it real, right? Like if it's Metivier is on the first thing. Study Metivier more, that sort of thing. Well, I shared an image. The Mets with Liv Tyler in the audience going, yay, right? Well, you make that loud in your mind. You imagine what it feels like to be in Liv Tyler's body going, yay, the physical feeling of that. And there are many other magnetic modes to apply. And then you go to the next part of the mind map or the station on the mind map and the next and the next. It's only 12 that I'm asking you to complete. If that seems like it's too much, go for three, go for six, go for nine, whatever it is. There's no magic numbers here. None whatsoever. Just the numbers that you put on that mind map. And they can be magic beans, real magic beans, but you got to treat them magically, so to speak, or better said, magnetically. And that's what the Magnetic Mary Method is all about. Accomplishment. Activity leading to accomplishment. So you may choose a different thing than a vision to get started, but a lot of people these days are lacking vision. So the sooner you practice the practice of formulating a vision and getting it out on paper, the sooner you'll have the map to follow and you'll remember all its parts. If you want to know more about mind mapping, check out this playlist of mind mapping tactics and secrets that I created on this channel and go through the entire thing. Take notes, mind map the material like Kecko did, and do whatever it takes to get yourself taking activity and turning it into accomplishment. That's what I call keeping yourself magnetic.